Thanks very much. Um, Okie doke, I think we're ready to go. So my name's Nick, I'm Nick Imry, I'm the Fundraising and Marketing Manager for the Nasio Trust. And just in case there's some people here who aren't familiar with our charity, we are a small charity who work to protect and support vulnerable children and their communities out in Western Kenya. So we're delighted to welcome Harry today, he's going to be doing a talk on conservation for us. Just before we start that, just to let you know, this is being recorded, and that means that people who miss it today and aren't able to join because of work commitments can then go and have a look on our YouTube channel and watch it at a later date. So with that in mind, please make sure that you've got your cameras turned off and your microphone set to mute. There's going to be the chance to ask questions to Harry. So he's gonna do a talk for us first. And then if you've got any conservation questions, please do type those in. You can type them into the chat function. You can find the chat button in the middle at the bottom of your screen. Type those in and then once Harry's finished his talk, we'll come to the questions and he can answer those at the end. All right. Okay, Harry, handing over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Nick. I'm just gonna share my screens to get the slides up. Okay, is, is that all working? That's lovely. Yeah, you might want to put it on a bigger view. Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Great. Well, um, thank you very much, Nick, and thank you to everyone uh, attending today. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, especially with such a great organisation like the Nazio Trust. And um, yes, just delighted to be able to speak about my conservation journey and tell you a bit more about the work which we have done with the Nazio Trust as well. So firstly, just a, a bit about myself and, and my journey into conservation. So I, sorry, just get back there. So by, by background, I'm actually a qualified lawyer and have been working in the legal and social impact sector for the past 10 years. And I really got into conservation at 2016, where during that time, it was just on the back end of the Paris Agreement which was signed at the end of 2015. And 2016 was a really, quite a lot of things going on in conservation in 2016 from the, the forest fires in Indonesia and Borneo and Sumatra, which killed 100,000 people to the huge increase in poaching uh, in both elephants and both rhinos across Africa. So it was a really important time for conservation issues. And during my training contract, I was training to be a lawyer in London. I started to um, write a blog and to talk more about these different conservation issues. But even five years ago, not many people really in the, in the private sector were really engaged in conservation issues. And you can kind of see how much progress we've made in terms of engagement and talking about these issues in just five years. So when I was training to be a lawyer, I had this blog and I was really talking about some of the conservation issues that were going on. But I realized that this was obviously just the first start to really get me more involved in, in conservation. I then qualified uh, as a solicitor and worked at a large firm in Devon. And it was really then that I started to get more involved in environmental activism and actually launched my own uh, conservation small charity called the Conservation Project International. But one of the things which I, obviously there were all these different issues going on around wildlife conservation. But there was also some deeper issues going on, which I became aware of. And most of my friends that were working in marine biology or zoology and had done an undergraduate or a postgraduate degree on environmental science would leave university and really struggle to find a job in the conservation sector. And I was absolutely baffled by this because we were faced with so many of these in urgent and um, huge issues that we needed to face and address as a civilization and the people who were really passionate about these issues were really struggling to find a job in the sector so it really empowered me really to to set up the conservation project as a as a sort of platform for young conservationists so people who come from all different backgrounds from lower income families from you know different uh, different sort of demographics a place where they can write articles, where they can share the work that they've done, an undergraduate or postgraduate. But really, we wanted to create a platform where we could help support and mentor young conservationists and help them find, um, introduce them through networking and linking, help them find a job in the sector so they could become the future change makers of tomorrow. 
and it was a it was a really exciting time to do this and and i actually left my job as a corporate solicitor to set up conservation project international i stupidly moved to the Maldives, not stupidly but it was an amazing opportunity and and lived there on a remote island for three months working in coral and uh, turtle conservation and our first kind of real project we launched was at the back end of 2017 when i took two of our young volunteers to bonn in germany and we spoke at the climate of youth conference just before the cop after the paris agreement in bonn and then we set up a shark project in the uk which was working on blue shark conservation research and through through all of these different projects that we have been involved in over the last five years we've helped over 500 young people by linking them to different research projects in the world through networking and through mentorship. And it's been one of the most amazing things that I've done with my career so far. And when I moved back to London after spending some time in the Maldives and undertaking conservation research myself, I, I met Dr. Nancy Hunt, who um, I met her at King's College London, where she was speaking about the amazing work that she had been doing through the NASIO Trust. I was really enthralled with, with the Nancy's journey and some of the, the incredible work that, that she's doing in Kenya. And we started talking about the interrelations between conservation and poverty and how all of these issues, especially in Kenya, are extremely interlinked with one another. And we wanted to actually come up with a project ourselves where we could send interns from Oxford University to go over to Kenya to really get an understanding of some of the conservation and environmental issues that are going on there. And this um, led us to launch our first joint internship research program with Oxford University, where we sent two amazing interns, both Nelson and Katriana, to Kenya in the summer of 2018. And this was a really exciting project. And I myself interviewed around 40 uh, young conservationists from Oxford University themselves. All of them were absolutely phenomenal, really enthusiastic, super intelligent and bright, and really wanted to go out there in the field to understand the complexity of the issues and to actually come up with new solutions to help try and solve them. And this was exactly what Nancy and I wanted to do. Um, Nancy was really interested in finding out more about the conservation issues and how they're interlinked with poverty, but also enabling young people to go out there to witness these things themselves and to come up with new strategies to help overcome them. And the joint internship programme, it focused on sort of four, four main real areas of focus. One was looking at education and how conservation in Kenya itself, how conservation and environmental uh, concerns are embedded in the curriculum in Kenyan schools. We looked at the um, issues of plastic pollution in Kenya. So the interns would go and do a, a lot of work and research around the impact of plastic pollution, both in terrestrial and non-terrestrial wildlife. And then the, the other areas were focused on community-based conservation. So what methods are communities coming up with to, um, to increase conservation in, in the conservancies in Kenya, but also to overcome issues like climate change. And then looking at human wildlife conflicts. And today, because we only have a short amount of time, I'm going to focus on the, the issues of education and, and conservation in the curriculum in Kenyan schools, and then moving on to um, the human wildlife conflict in the Masai Mara region. So the, the interns did some fantastic work, and when they were there, they focused in on two schools, where they interviewed a number of students and teachers through questionnaires and other data methods to really get a sense of how embedded conservation education is in the curriculum. And if, and if there is a demand from both teachers and students to do more around conservation education. The first sort of bullet point you'll see there was that only 26.67% of respondents answered yes when they were asked, is environmental education um, part of the curriculum in Kenyan schools? And, and that was obviously quite a bit, a bit of a shocker for me when we saw that. But then you combine sort of that statistic there with some of the other data research which we had. The, the graph on the right uh, was a, were the results of a questionnaire for teachers on asking them whether they thought it was important to include conservation education in the curriculum. And you can see there that there was an overwhelming response from teachers, sort of 66% strongly agreeing and 33% agreeing as well. But moreover, the, the students themselves really had uh, a passion for conservation and 
there was such a, an agreement that um, they wanted to learn more and wanted to get more, more involved in protecting wildlife species in Kenya. So you can see there that 73.3% um, agreed that they enjoyed learning about conservation and environmental matters. Nearly 94% of um, students agreed that it was important to protect wild animals. And 97, nearly 98%, sorry, agreed that conservation education should be taught in schools. So quite an interesting um, response is there, showing that conservation education is something there is a demand for it, both from teachers, but both also from students in Kenya. And the report which the interns put together outlined a number of activities and ways in which schools could actually engage in conservation um, themselves. So here are just two examples from sort of tree planting activities for students, reforestation programs, the establishment of school nurseries for to bring back and rewild sort of native species of wildlife and conservation. But the overwhelming consensus um, that the report showed was that there was still a huge amount of work to be done uh, in, in ensuring that the curriculum, education curriculums in schools in Kenya address major environmental concerns, but also conveyed messages of hope and showed how students themselves can actually get involved in conservation and be empowered and equipped to safeguard their natural environment for future generations to come. It also suggested that there was much deeper issues there, especially when it comes to the criminal convergence of illegal wildlife trafficking and illegal poaching, um, with a much more focus also on some huge environmental challenges like plastics and climate change as well. And the, the, the interns also looked, as I mentioned at the start, they went into it, they looked very much into what were the drivers of human wildlife conflict in the Maasai Mara and what other solutions can they come up with to help reduce um, human wildlife conflict. So that the Mara, as you know, is one of the most beautiful and biodiverse areas in the world. I often think of it as like the Mona Lisa of the conservation world, these beautiful and incredible species, the great migration and just a fantastic place. But sadly, over the last sort of three decades, the wildlife species are continuing to decline at an alarming rate. Some research suggested that between 1977 and 2009, there's been a 75% reduction in wildlife species. The giraffe populations are down by 95%, and there's been a 58% decline of non-migratory species. Now, the main causes of decline include human population growth, the degradation and fragmentation of um, the habitat of the Mara. Poaching, mentioned the illegal poaching, of not only of um, both elephants and rhino, but of other species as well. Livestock, and we'll come back to that one in a minute, and an overwhelming policy failure, both from a national and an international standpoint. But one of the interesting things to come out of the research when we, when we talk about human wildlife conflict, we, we often think of scenarios where elephants may come and eat uh, agricultural, you know, different crops that have been grown by farmers, or um, the, the lion, for example, coming in and taking livestock or actually injuring uh, the, the community themselves. But one of the, the things that the report picked up on, which I think is extremely pertinent at the moment, is the issue of uh, disease transmission from wildlife to humans, to livestock and other domesticated animals. So this, this spread of zoonic diseases and research has suggested that as environmental and um, habitat destruction continues, the spread of zoonic diseases coming from uh, wildlife species and the transmission to humans will only increase. And we've seen that through the global pandemic in the past uh, and many other different health issues. So that was a major concern which was highlighted. Of the, um, the community members and, and the, the farmers and the, the different Maasai um, community living there, that the interns actually interviewed and, and did this sort of research data collection with. The respondents living on the ground there suggested that livestock was the main source of their livelihood. And they also stated that wildlife predation and crop raiding was also a top threat to livelihoods in the community. So this gave an indication that, you know, there was a, lo a lot of issues around human wildlife conflict, especially as livestock and agriculture is, is such an important source of livelihood to many of the communities living in the Mara. But even despite that, and despite this really interesting statistic here, that 57.5% of respondents uh, had stated that at least one of their members of their household had been attacked by a wild animal, which is coming from England, where we have sort of foxes and badgers and hedgehogs. We don't really think about those kind of scenarios. 
but 85% of respondents still believe that it was important to protect wildlife in communal areas. And I think that's a really important statistic. And you can see here just some, some of the graphs and some of the data collection from, from the, uh, the work that the interns did. This, this first graph here shows the, the correlation between the increase in livestock uh, species like goat, sheep and cattle over the last sort of 40 to 40 years, and then the steep, the steady decline of um, wildlife species in the Mara. So we've got wildlife gazelle and zebra numbers continuing to decline from sort of 1975 and onwards. And unfortunately that correlation is continuing to go. The second graph shows the, um, the, the sort of frequency of encounters with, wild, with wildebeest, elephants and lions um, from communities based there. So 72.5% of the respondents suggest, stated that they saw elephants on a weekly or monthly basis. Wildebeest were seen monthly by 64.86% of the respondents, um, but only 42.86% of the respondents uh, only saw lions rarely. But you can kind of see the sort of daily, weekly and monthly interactions with some of the wildlife living in this area. Many of the complaints as well, um, this data, again, focusing on wildebeest, elephant and lion. So some of these, these were really, we collected what were the main complaints regarding wildlife relating to these different species. And it was quite interesting. In terms of elephants, 77.5% of respondents were really concerned with the core injury that elephants pose to communities. 40% were bothered by elephants damaging property. But interestingly, when it comes to lions, the main concern was really around um, the, the impact that lions have when it comes to livestock. Injury to humans came sort of secondly at 17.5%. And then you can see, you compare that to wildebeest, which were having um, not as much impact as sort of elephants and lions uh, to community members as well. And then this, this graph is also, um, it's really interesting. So we, we asked the uh, respondents on the ground whether or not they wanted to see an increase or a decrease in the populations of wildebeest, elephants and lions. And again, it, this shows that the importance to conservation and the importance to the natural world in Kenya. So 94.59% of respondents wanted to see an increase in wildebeest populations, 63.16% wanted to see an increase in the populations of elephants, even regardless that elephants were sort of um, leading to injuries and crop raiding and that kind of thing. And then also nearly 60% wanted to see an increase in lion populations. So overall, there is a desire to see an increase in wildlife populations in, in the Mara region. So the report sort of covered all of these different areas and showed where the scenarios for human wildlife conflict and went in, it's about 150 pages long, so it covers a huge amount of different scenarios but it also outlined some potential recommendations that could be implemented to reduce human wildlife conflict. And these covered issues such as training and capacity building, raising more awareness, looking at sort of compensation when it comes to crop raiding and things like that, um, looking at other methods to um, reduce the chances of lions and elephants actually coming into a community a sort of areas and, and reducing the likelihood of, of conflict happening. Um, so that we, we will share these, uh, we're going to share all of the data and all of the reports on our website soon, so you can have a, have a, a sort of more look into some of the really important um, policy and cover issues which can reduce these things from happening. So where does that leave me now? So I'm continuing to run the conservation project. I still work full time, but I've also now launched a new social enterprise, which is called Bright Tide. So as well as focusing in on young conservationists and helping to find them, uh, empower them to find jobs and also to get them more involved in conservation, I have a real passion for trying to build the connections between the conservation world and the private sector. So as obviously as working as a lawyer, one of the things which I really value about the private sector is the efficiency and the effectiveness of sort of getting stuff done. You know, when I'm presented with a, um, when I was working as a lawyer, if we got presented with a case, you know, or a, or a transaction, we would do everything we could to ensure that we meet those deadlines for clients and we, we got the transaction done. And for me, I feel that this is a fundamental and pivotal moment in, in conservation. We have, we have faced with all of these huge issues and the conservation scientists and NGOs can't do this alone. We have to engage with the private sector 
that has the power, that has the effectiveness, that has the cross sector of skills to really attack these issues from a holistic standpoint. And we are severely running out of time. So my new organization, Bright Tide, it focuses in on the risks that uh, nature, the decline in biodiversity in nature poses to the private sector, but also offers an opportunity for private sector organizations to get involved with um, different number of different ways in which they themselves, their employees and their clients can actually come up with new solutions to help conservation science on the ground. And it's, it's really interesting at the, the back end of the G7, for example, last week, and there's a new task force which has been set up, which will hopefully come into play at the end of the year, which is all around uh, looking at the, the risk that um, nature, the decline in nature poses to private sector organisations. And here the World Economic Forum has suggested that half of the world's GDP is highly moderately dependent on nature, which is huge. So if you think about the decline in biodiversity that we continue to see, as well as the climate crisis, which is again, continuing to accelerate, both of these are interlinked as well as all of the poverty and education that we've spoken about. And all of these pose a huge risk to our global economy. They, the pandemic I think has shown um, how, uh, how we weren't ready to deal with the scale of, of such a huge magnitude. Anyway, um, Bright Tide, it focuses in on a number of ways in which we can engage with private sector organizations. So we run hackathons where corporate employees can get involved, can find new solutions to different environmental matters. We run workshops where we can introduce global conservation speakers and then run challenges to propose solutions. We also do lunch and learn talks and webinars as well. So we can help engage and educate the private sector about different conservation issues and also point ways in which they can get involved themselves. And just, just lastly, just um, one of the most amazing events we ran recently was a, a global hackathon to try and come up with new solutions to um, save the vaquita, which is the most critically endangered marine species on earth from extinction. So this is this small little porpoise here that lives in the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. There's now less than 10 remaining on earth and they're, they're declining, like, probably going to be extinct soon sadly because of a um, massive issue with uh, the convergence between environmental crime and, and the illegal wildlife trade so illegal fishing fishermen in the sea of cortez are, are fishing for a fish called the totoaba fish which is a big sort of sea bass fish which itself is critically endangered and the bladder of that fish is sold on the uh, on the black market in china and also in southeast asia so Mexican cartel gangs, which are in, um, in San Felipe and other fishing villages in the Sea of Cortez, are actually um, putting down these huge fishing nets called gill nets. And the poor vaquita is being caught in these nets. And many marine species in the, in the Sea of Cortez are also struggling. So we brought together 130 people from around the world, many young people from 18 different countries. And we set a number of challenges focused in on what kind of new legal solutions can uh, junior lawyers and lawyers come up with to try and increase prosecution rates in wildlife crime, but also use international law as a mechanism to uh, stop this illegal wildlife trade. We looked at data solutions so using geospatial technology and automation technology to come up with AI translation tools, but creating geospatial maps to sort of plot the convergence points along the supply chain. And then coming up with new communications campaign one of the most amazing things about the vaquita is that no one had even even heard of it. And this was the most um, unique and critically endangered marine species, which is literally on the point of going extinct. So we wanted to come up with new um, campaign ideas, which can help raise awareness about the plight of the vaquita. And after that, we created 12 solutions, which are still um, the groups are working on. We've published a legal white paper with a huge law firm. And we're continuing to work on more and more of these challenges and engaging the private sector to actually become part of the solution to conservation as well. So I, I just wanna thank um, Nancy and everyone at the Nazio Trust again um, for the amazing work they're doing. It's been such a privilege to work with them on these issues in Kenya and, and also all of you for, for being interested in conservation issues. And, I really hope that over the next decade, more of us can come into the space and uh, try and turn things around before it's too late. So thank you very much and uh, very happy to answer any questions.
Fantastic. Thanks, Harry. So I'll read out a few questions. Oh, we've got somebody, uh, uh, Gibson from Kenya has joined the discussion. Thank you for joining us. That's fantastic to have you here. Um, so we've got a couple of questions from Chantelle, if you wouldn't mind. Firstly, what can we do ourselves to help with conservation on an everyday level? Yeah, brilliant question, Chantelle. So, so there are a number of things you can do really. Um, I think when it comes to your own uh, lifestyle, there are a number of different things you can do. So focusing in on trying to reduce your plastic waste, um, maybe trying to become vegetarian or vegan, maybe one or two days a month to see how you get on and then transition to uh, become a full-time vegetarian or vegan. That's something you can do. Uh, I'm trying to do that myself as well. But then also just getting involved, um, raising awareness, I think is one of the easiest ways you could do. So, you know, sharing posts about different conservation issues, um, getting people to sign up and volunteer and, and really just trying to change the mindsets of, of many different people who are not in this space. I think for a lot of us that we we sometimes live in like a, our own ecosystem. So, you know, we're really passionate about conservation issues. But many people are just, just not aware um, of, of the extent of the many challenges that we're going to be facing. So I think raising awareness, whether that's through, you know, doing some social media posts or sharing posts yourself, um, signing up, volunteering yourself. There are many like different ways in which you can get involved. Brilliant. And she's also asking, is this something you've always been passionate about since you were young? Yes, it has. I've always been really passionate about uh, conservation ever since I was a, a very small child. I used to chase after fox hunters when I was younger. The fox was always my, my favourite animal. Um, and then I lived in Australia as well when I was younger, so I used to sort of um, chase after snakes and things like that. So, yeah, I've always, always absolutely loved nature and I've never been more passionate about it. Fantastic. And we've got a question from Adam. He says, thanks so much. I have two younger children and often feel a bit overwhelmed by not knowing what messages to give them on how to make positive change to conserve wildlife and natural resources. Does the change have to come from the wider economic system or can individuals make a difference now? What's your message for the next generation? That's a brilliant question. I, I think it's, a, it, it's, it's both. I think the big changes have to come from government, have to come from business. So that's why a lot of my work is actually focused in on trying to engage the private sector and, and, and showing them that actually the natural world is something valuable and worth saving. And if you don't save it, there's going to be huge economic risks to your business, but also to the wider economy. And they're both tied together because if you look at the, the shift that has changed over the last sort of five years, you've had the Fridays for the Future movement through Greta Thunberg, you've had Extinction Rebellion, but you've also had like David Attenborough. And I remember when Blue Planet came out and the, how that encapsulated the, the British public. And more and more people were talking about marine conservation, for example. And then when more people are engaged in conservation, and this is something all of us can do, and the government realises that it becomes a political issue. So then they keep talking about it more and more so they can get your vote. So I think it, it's a combination of putting pressure on policymakers in the private sector, but then also working with the private sector as well to try and transition them to becoming more responsible and more sustainable as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. God, it's fascinating, isn't it? We've got Kaylee thanking you for a great talk. And Hallison's asking, are all the young trees in Kenya in plastic bags and what happens to them? I don't know if you'll know the answer to that one. I think is that talking about the saplings when they arrive, the tree seedlings? Don't know if Nancy's listening and can answer that question. Possibly not. We'll get back to you. I've got a note of your name and so we can find out and, and reply to you via email after the event. And Tamzine's saying, thank you so much, Harry. Can you please kindly highlight on how one can be conservationist and how can we involve the student community in conservation? Yeah, sure. So, so again, this, this concept of what a conservationist is, I, think, I, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a set thing. I think we're all conservationists. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the work I want to do is sort of break down the silos and the elitism in conservation because all of us are conservationists and all of us can call ourselves conservationists because if you're passionate about the natural world, then you are a conservationist. Yeah. So um, there are many things that you can, you can do. And I think the really important point as well is, is how we can engage. And this is part of the work which I don't actually focus on. But how can we engage with primary school children and children of a younger age? in uh, environmental matters and I would be really interested to learn just as the work we did with the curriculum in Kenya 
the extent to which uh, environmental and climate issues are actually spoken about in primary schools. Because I think, you know, getting children at a young age really engaged and passionate about these issues is really important when it comes when they obviously progress through their own educational career, um, but then professional career as well. So I think that's a really important point you raised about working with sort of younger um, pupils as well. Yeah, they definitely do touch on conservation. My daughter's at primary at the moment and they did a big project about the rainforest and the dangers, you know, to that area. So I'm sure it's something and they all get really fascinated about things like that. So definitely a good target audience. We've got a message again from Gibson just saying this is a great event. Conservation is what is needed, especially now when we have rising population leading to the destruction of conservation. And it's why I started a sports organisation to teach young boys and girls about environmental conservation here in Kenya. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Lovely. Um, I think we've all learned an awful lot today, haven't we? I'm just going to share my screen now um, for a moment. Sorry, Harry, I think I've switched off okay. <laughs> control there for a moment. Just to say just a couple of words about what's going on um, on the NASIO side. Obviously, Kenya's had its own challenges from climate change, and including the really devastating floods that they experienced, the community area that we work in. Um, the banks of one of the main rivers burst in um, 2020. And unfortunately, many lives were lost due to the flooding and the landslides that it caused. And of course, with Flooding comes the increase in prevalence of disease. So NACIO increased our campaigns on sanitation and on malaria um, in response to this. And as Harris talked about in his um, speech earlier, we are very passionate about NAS at NACIO about environmental conservation. And we have a tree planting project. You can see in the top left photo here, this is a group of some of our guardians so we have a guardian looking after each of the um, vulnerable children that we support and they each plant one tree a month, a wood tree or a fruit tree. And um, so that's been really important. And the top, the bottom right photo shows a group. This is really interesting. We were very lucky to receive a donation whoops, of 5000 tree saplings just this weekend gone. And the guy in the green shirt is the bank manager, a local bank donated 5000 saplings. And he brought some of his team along and they joined up with NASIO children. You can see some of the kids in the background and some of the NASIO staff and guardians. And they all got together on a very hot day on Saturday. Nancy was there to take this photo and help do the planting. So that was wonderful. And tree planting is also carried out by our Young Farmers Club. So this was an initiative that was set up during the pandemic last year when, of course, the schools were closed for many, many months. And it gave young people an opportunity to learn some really valuable, important skills about sustainable farming and food production. So here you can see some of the kids getting involved. Um, we look after kids from age 10 upwards in this project. And last year, 83 young people were able to plant their own kitchen gardens. And that's really important. It meant that they were able to feed their own families from the produce and also sell any extra produce as extra income. So that's just a little bit about what we've been up to in Kenya. Um, Harry has very generously donated his time for us today for free. So if you have enjoyed the talk and you'd like to show your appreciation, you could donate a pound or two towards our projects in Kenya by visiting the web address shown on the screen here. Thank you very much to everybody for joining. Just to let you know, we'll be having another live Zoom event next month and we'll be sending information about that out in due course where we're going to be welcoming Danny Mosley, who's, who runs her own cookery company called Family Feasts in London. And she's very kindly said she'll come and give us a live cookery demonstration, showing us how we can make a quick and easy recipe incorporating the superfood spirulina. And spirulina is something that we grow out in Kenya to feed to our malnourished children. It's full of essential nutrients and it's amazing stuff. So we'll be sending out information about that in our forthcoming e-newsletters and there'll be information about it on our social media as well. If you haven't signed up for our e-newsletter and you'd like to do so, please just visit our website, thenasiotrust.org and at the bottom of every page, you'll see there's a little sign up bar. You can just pop your email address in there, click sign up and we'll be happy to keep you in touch with what we've been up to. Thank you, Rebecca, who says, thank you so much. I'll certainly be donating. Very kind, thank you. A massive thanks to you all for joining us today and I'm sure you're all desperate to get out into the lovely sun. So I will sign off 
and I look forward to seeing you next month. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone.